Hello everybody. A few people in the comment section have told me that I am not a very good YouTuber, and I suppose in some ways they are right, because I recently sold my Ferrari 430 Scuderia, and if I were a proper YouTuber over the next six months, I would give you at least half a dozen videos talking about cars that I'm never actually going to buy. Instead, what I'm going to do is today tell you why I sold my Ferrari 430 Scuderia and introduce you to its replacement. So, let's get the funky intro music rolling. Last year, I bought my Ferrari 430 Scuderia, something I still can't quite believe because not only was that my first mid-engine Ferrari, sure, not my first Ferrari, but for many, the mid-engine car are the ones we think of, but it was a special, it was a Scuderia. That's a car from the same bloodline as the Challenge Stradale, the 458 Speciale, so on and so forth. And um, that's not the sort of thing that I thought I would ever be able to achieve. So to be able to have that alongside my 550 really was more than dream material. That was surreal. Unfortunately, the ownership experience didn't go quite as smoothly as I had hoped. During the test drive of that car, I identified a few minor problems with the car, one of which was a rattle from the suspension. I mentioned that to the dealership at the time, and they said it would be tended to. In all fairness, I didn't really think anything more of it at the time. 360s and 430s are known for an appetite for bushings and ball joints. That's just the way that they are. So I figured it was one of those and a relatively easy fix. Unfortunately, when I went to pick the car up, nothing had actually been done to rectify said rattle. So I mentioned it again. They looked at the car, agreed, yes, that's not right. They fixed a few things, put some new bushes in it, but said more work would be required. So a few weeks later, the car went back into them. They did some more stuff. It seemed like it was fixed. And then a couple of hundred miles later, the rattle came back. Then it went back to them, so on and so forth. Just so you don't think I am being very particular, this is what the rattle was like. As you can imagine, over time that does get rather tiring, particularly when you're in a car with no stereo so you can't simply turn the radio up and drown it out. I was also concerned that evidently what was happening was something moving that wasn't meant to. So for that reason I never really got to take the car on track and I think it's fair to say at no point did I really own that car without it having an issue. The last attempt to fix it happened in December of 2021, when they had the car for two months, actually replaced the dampers on it, said that was definitely going to cure it, and then when the car came back to me, five days and a hundred miles later, the rattle was back. So, I went to Dick Lovett and said, look, we have replaced everything on the suspension haven't we and they said yeah we, we kind of have happily in the time that i'd owned the car the values of them had actually gone up by a fair bit so they bought the car back from me at the price that i had paid they could then hopefully fix it in their own time retail it themselves not lose too much money i got essentially all of my deposit back and i think everyone was fairly happy but that left me with a very enviable dilemma what do I replace my 430 Scuderia with? I know a lot of people thought the reason I got rid of it was to make room for my F12, both financially and physically, but that isn't true at all. You see, YouTube time and real time for me are quite unrelated to one another, and often you'll see things out of sequence, and generally speaking, you'll always see stuff a long time after it's actually happened. So, I sold my 430 actually about two weeks after I'd done the deal to buy the F12. The two events were not related at all all. I was very excited about the proposition of being able to say I own three Ferraris, but I also wasn't going to hold on to the 430 if it wasn't the right thing to do. So that car had to go. This left me with, yes, a very, very lovely F12, but the F12 is a different car to the 430. So then, what to get instead? Well, let's stop teasing you and just show you.
Yes, that's right, I bought another Ferrari 430 Scuderia. And you might reasonably be wondering, if I just went and got the same thing again, why it's taken me so long to tell all of you. After all, it's basically August now, and I sold the last one in February. I'll address that, in part, at the end of the video. But it wasn't exactly a foregone conclusion. Yes, I was always considering buying another 430, but there were a lot of options on the table. Truth be told, my very first thought was that I should buy absolutely anything but a Ferrari 430 Scuderia. In fact, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to buy another Ferrari at all. Here's roughly how my thought process went. I have a reasonably strict policy, not that I'm very good at adhering to it, of trying to make sure that every car I own is different to all the others already on the driveway. So no more front engine GTs, after all I already had two with a Ferrari badge on and three would certainly be excessive. <laughs> I was very prepared to make a compromise and get a 911. Rear engined, I figure, is close enough to mid engined, and I certainly did consider a few of those. In terms of budget, I didn't really want to spend any more than I already had on the 430, so in theory, that would mean my budget was about the same as the purchase price of that, 175 grand or so. However, in practice, what I actually had to play with was the same amount of deposit, so 50 grand. In practice, I had two real trains of thought. First off, I could take my 50 grand deposit, try and top it up a little bit, and then buy something outright. Or I simply do another finance deal. If I went the latter route, I had to make sure that this wasn't just going to be a personal thing, although of course I want to buy a car that I want to own. However, it's got to be something that makes some business sense. So that immediately ruled out stuff like the Ferrari 360, because Sam has already made so much brilliant content, though it did leave open the 355. Kind of glad I didn't get one of those now, because Mr. JWW has already got one of those. The Porsche thing also was a little bit tricky, because the option of a GT3 was certainly there, but I felt like a GT3 in terms of YouTube has really been done to death. I love them to pieces, but for me, I just felt like maybe it wasn't quite the right thing. A Lamborghini was certainly on the cards, and as you may already know, I went to Test Drive and Aventador, but it just didn't work out that well. I wasn't really impressed with the car as a whole, and there were a few limitations of it, particularly in terms of storage, that meant it really wasn't going to suit my lifestyle. A shame really, because I think I could have actually made a lot of content on one of those cars, and maybe one day I'll revisit the Lamborghini thing again. I did consider the all new Maserati MC20, because I figured that's a brand new car, this could be exciting times to be talking about Maseratis, however, I looked at the prices of those and they're um, very very expensive. There are no deals of any kind available on them. The nearest dealer willing to even pick up the phone was about 200 miles away and I looked at the price list, worked out what the spec I'd want was going to be, and it was something like 240 grand, which was going to mean in practice it was going to cost something like double what this did. I then started thinking, okay, this was a hardcore, stripped out road racer. What else is that kind of thing, but not a 430 Scuderia? I was browsing a couple of auction sites and something very, very exciting turned up. A Lotus Esprit Sport 300. If you know your Esprits, you'll know that's the daddy. And helping me, there is nearly no content whatsoever on YouTube about them. A short piece from Carfection from a few years ago, and that's essentially it. So. A very cool car with real race pedigree that is quite exciting to drive, according to all who've driven one. However, the particular example up for auction did have a colourful history. Speaking of which, it was yellow, and a yellow Lotus and me, well, that's just a match made in heaven. I thought it'd be a lovely way to return to the roots of the channel and do some more Lotus stuff. But I managed to speak to one of that car's previous owners, and I found out that if the auction listing was accurate, the car hadn't really turned a wheel for many years. It had only done something like another 100 miles since the last guy sold it, and uh, I felt that meant I was likely to be given some pretty big bills pretty early on, and I just 
didn't fancy that. Also, it has some very unusual tyre sizes, even more unusual in some ways than the Lamborghini Countach, because you can buy Countach tyres reasonably easy. No, they're not cheap, but Sport 300 tyres are simply unavailable, and the only place I could find listing them, they were out of stock, and they were four grand a piece. I'm pretty sure that's their way of saying we don't have any, but uh, yeah, that's annoying. Those of you who've been watching the channel for a while will know I have a real bugbear about sports cars with old tyres. The ones on this are only about 18 months old. The Cup 2s though, which I'm not in love with. When it's like this, brilliant. When it's not, eh. A small bonus of sorts, and certainly not a deciding factor with getting another Scuderia, is the fact that this being the internet, wonderful and balanced place that it is, I was fairly certain there'd be a lot of people out there who figured I only got rid of the last car because I wanted the F12, that I was going to be using the issues that car had as a way to get rid. But uh, no, not the case at all. a considerably more significant factor is the fact that I am a bit of a weirdo and I love things to match, to pair up. Please let me know in the comment section if you're the same way or I am just on my own here but uh, I'm hoping I'm not. I like owning things, not just cars, that complement each other. I don't like owning many of the same thing, as I know some people do, and I kind of get that. I want to have things that bring a variety to the table, bring something different. This is the reason I wanted to get another supercar, because with the 430 gone, I didn't have one. And supercars to me are a very, very specific breed of car. When the deal on the F12 was done, I was absolutely ecstatic. Not just because I was going to be getting an F12, but because also I was going to now have a trio of Ferraris, which is pretty ridiculous to be honest, but also that they would be three beautifully complementary cars that would each represent something very different about the brand. So you have the 550, the classic front engine GT, in some ways a very new car for the company then, but looking at it now, still deliciously old school. Steel tubular frame, manual six-speed gearbox, that classic naturally aspirated V12. Then you have the 430, the stripped out mid-engined V8 racer with its ultra sharp paddle shift F1 gearbox and its razor sharp looks. A car that should be uttered in the same breath as legends like the Challenge Stradale and the 458 Speciale. Then we have the F12, the modern car, twin clutch gearbox, screaming 700 plus horsepower engine, 211 mile an hour top speed, performance to make your eyes melt and a real stunner. The last car to be styled for Ferrari by Pininfarina. It is a sensational all-rounder, more modern than the 550, just as quick as this, but easy to use and an absolute joy. That trio gave me one car from the 90s, one car from the noughties, one car from the 10s, one with a manual, one with a single clutch, and one with a dual clutch gearbox. Three Pininfarina icons, one old school V12, one new, one V8, two front engine, one mid engined I think it's pretty fair to say that if you told me, James, that's it for you and Ferrari ownership, I'd still be a very, very happy man. So when I was considering other stuff like, say, the California, which I would happily have owned, a first gen one actually, Cali 30, what a beautiful car to be driving around while it's as warm and sunny as it is now. I couldn't help but think, yeah, but okay, it's a front engine V8, so something a little bit different, but uh, it's not the mid-engine V8, it's not the one that people always think about when you say Ferrari, and yeah, it's cool, it's nice, but I don't think it would have fit in the lineup in the same way. I'm not sure it could have quite put the same smile on my face. This is such a driver's car, so raw, so focused, and just so mesmerizing. A 458 
was considered, but I figured in many ways, probably a little bit too close to the F12. Likewise, the 355, I fear maybe it's a little bit too close to the 550. If I do get another Ferrari, a 355 is very, very high on the list. But the fact is, if I do get one, it has to be the right one. I suppose then, that's a good a cue as any to tell you just a little bit more about this one. At a very quick glance, this certainly appears to be much the same as my last 430. However, the longer you look, the more differences you will spot. The most obvious, of course, is the change of colour. The last one was grey, Grigio Silverstone. This one is black, Nero Daytona. Actually, a very lovely shade with a lot of metallic in it. When the car is clean and the sun is out, it does look spectacular. But truth be told, this was not the colour I ever would have picked for this car. I'll talk more about that in a bit. The honest truth is that the exterior colour of a car nowadays is actually one of the easiest things to change. Likewise, the wheels. The last one, I had gold wheels put on. These are currently in their factory original darker shade, and I may change those because, let's be honest, black with gold wheels is a cool colour combo. There was actually only one piece of specification I was totally inflexible on, and that was the harnesses. For me, they're a key part of the Ferrari 430 Scuderia experience. But unfortunately, unlike Porsche, when you spec harnesses in a Ferrari, you get them in place of the three-point seatbelts, which means, even for these, they're a relatively rare option. I've been browsing the classifieds for quite some time whilst thinking what it was I was going to replace my old 430 with. And of course, I was always looking at another Scuderia, but generally speaking, there was always something wrong about each one I looked at. Either it was a colour that I really didn't like, the miles were too low, so the price too high, and the chance of depreciation too great, or the specification simply missed too many things from my old one. This car I saw a few times, but simply skipped past because it was black and looked fairly plain. However, I then decided to investigate just a little bit closer, and I realised that this is one of the highest specification 430 Scuderias in the world. One of the problems with trying to buy a 430 Scuderia is that many vendors list stuff on cars as optional extras that were in fact standard. Case in point, the carbon fibre centre tunnel, that's standard. The carbon fibre air vents, they're standard. The carbon fibre engine bay, that's standard. But there were a few carbon fibre extras you could specify that not many people do. And this car, I believe, has all of them. So, like my last car, this has the carbon fibre headlights. My old car shouldn't actually have had them. They were put on by a previous owner. I knew they weren't original because when you spec the carbon headlights, they, for some reason, came with the carbon fibre little lip down here, which this car does have. More carbon fibre goodies. You have the wing mirrors on this car. Those are another standard item on a Scuderia but this car also has carbon fibre centre caps, which I believe are not original to the car, but are an official Ferrari option. The big one, though, is the carbon fibre side skirts. Yeah, this bit here, all of that to the back here is carbon. You can actually get that on a lot of Ferraris, not just the specials, but it's a very, very rare option. And uh, one of the reasons I'd skip past this car was that I had no idea that it had it, because um, it's a black car, and all of the carbon rather blends in. I really don't know who specced this car with all the carbon and then the black paint, because to me, I'd want it to stand out. Am I right? Do you feel the same way? Do you want your carbon to stand out? Because I do. Let me know in the comment section down below. But we're not finished with carbon goodies. Oh no. Around back we have two more fairly rare options for a 430 Scuderia. Now this piece here is always in carbon and I have seen a few people even fit this to a regular F430. But what's not standard is this big carbon diffuser, another expensive option. That side skirt is close to five grand, which is probably why many people simply don't tick the box. But for me, the coolest part of this car, and the only carbon fibre bit I probably would have ticked if ordering from new, is the engine cover. This is also carbon fibre, and for extra petrol head brownie points, you can see the carbon weave through the paint. Oh yes. 
other differences between this and my last one. This one has the fully lined boot option. Not that that really seems to make much of a difference and was an odd thing to see on the spec list because um, I would have thought with all the carbon fiber, the person ordering this wanted to go for a more hardcore track orientated spec but um, then they lined the boot, which to be honest just means two pieces of fabric on the side because even the unlined option still has some lining in it. This car is also missing the fire extinguisher that my previous one had, but that doesn't bother me because it would be old now and probably useless. I'm gonna put a fire safety stick back in this and that really will do the same job. This also is a 2010, which is a very late Scuderia. Most of them seem to be 2008, maybe 2009s. I believe in the USA, later Scuderias did get all of the carbon as standard, but I'm not sure that's true of the UK market. Perhaps someone out there can tell me if that's the case or not. Everything I've seen thus far tells me that a 2010 was ordered in the same way as a 2008. This car had a number of owners, not a big number, but a few. It was last purchased about three or four years ago by a gentleman who actually took it around Europe. And when he got this car, it had 6,000 miles on the clock. By the time he was done, it had 18,000. So it's a lower mile car than the one that I had before that had about 27,000 on the clock when I was done with it, but it's a higher specification. And for that reason, I was quite happy to pay the 8,000 pounds extra to get this over the last one. In terms of monthlies, that wound up being about 100 or 200 pound more. So in practice, not a massive difference. I have to say a huge thank you to Charles and Dean, my finance partner and a sponsor of this channel who financed this car for me and have been very helpful with both this and the F12. If you're looking at buying something, be it a 430, a 458, a classic French hatchback or a modern day hypercar, please give them a ring. They're really great people, very friendly and um, they are petrol heads, which helps. The interior is much the same as the last one, though there are some key differences. The Alcantara is black rather than dark grey, which does make a difference, though a subtle one. As mentioned before, it has the harnesses, and these are very important, not just because they are part of the Scuderia experience, but because they're almost impossible to retrofit. I mean, just look at it. That's one of the neatest harness installations I've ever seen in any car. You have, of course, the Roll Hoop 2, which is a separate option. And I love the fact it's covered in Alcantara with stitching to match the rest of the car. Speaking of which, this has yellow stitching rather than the gray of the previous one. And I think it lifts the interior just a little bit. Otherwise, it's all very much business as usual. You have a couple of options, the carbon fiber LED steering wheel. It also has an extra piece of carbon here, just as you step over the sill. Though I'm not the biggest fan of Alcantara, if I had a choice, I'd go for the leather interior. That is a very rare option. And at the least, this is a lot nicer than the base fabric interior that you do see some cars with. That to me just doesn't suit a car at this price point. One item I actually have changed in this car already is the shift paddles. The regular 430 Scuderia ones are disappointingly small, particularly compared with modern day Ferrari items. When these cars were made, I don't think they really thought people could be trusted to not change gear at the appropriate time. However, they soon learned that was not a big concern. So I've put these Carbonio items in, which are much longer and suit the car down to a T. They're made from essentially the same carbon material as all the other stuff in the car. So they blend in perfectly and look very OEM. A big thanks to Carbonio for sending me those. If you want some for your car, check out their website. As introductions go, I think we've covered all the basics. All that remains to be answered are two questions. First off, if I went and bought the same thing as I already had, why has it taken me so long to get this car at all? And what am I going to do with it? Well, I can answer both of those at the same time. The last Scuderia went back in February. I then decided at the end of that month that it was another 430 Scuderia that I wanted and a deal was done not long after. Paperwork was signed, things were sorted, but the car needed a little bit of prep work. There was a small bit of corrosion on it, a couple of other things needed sorting. This car had some decap pipes fitted, which made it sound horrendous. I do not like the sound of 430 Scuderias by default. I know many of you disagree with me on that one, but I don't. It's just a racket and uh, with a decap pipe on, it was terrible. So that had to be changed and we needed a couple of other small bits done as well. That took a month and a bit. Then I was away in Scotland for a few weeks. So it took about two months before I could pick the car up. Unfortunately, on the day that I got it, by the time I got home, I realized there were a few other things that needed sorting too. The geometry was out, there was a problem with the exhaust, 
and the dreaded rattle that had made me get rid of the last one was also present. I had test driven this car to make sure that wasn't the case and on the test drive I couldn't hear anything. Whether that was the decap pipe exhaust drowning things out I do not know but by the time I got home I was certain this car also had the issue. My first instinct was right, no, 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 let's not go through all of this again, let's just return the car, nobody ever needs to know that this happened. Then I quickly realised, no, hang on James, you're doing things the wrong way. You love this car, that's why you've bought a second one. I have a very strict policy of not repeating things, particularly when it comes to cars, but for all the reasons I've discussed already, I really wanted a 430 Scuderia. So I went to the supplying dealer and had a bit of a chat with them. They were understandably nervous about wanting to do anything with the suspension and they felt that this was simply normal for these cars. But to me, that's like saying an old Honda is rusty, it's normal, you should just accept it. No, the fact that they all do that doesn't mean it's okay. So. I made a proposal that they could pay me the same amount of money it would cost to get a nice full alignment and a few bushes done and I'll consider the suspension fixed even if it isn't. Now this is a bit of a gamble on my part because Dick Lovett threw something like 12 to 15 grand at this car trying to sort it and they didn't. So you could say that I've been stupid for taking a couple of grand to try and fix what they could not. But here's my logic. I thought first off, they've spent 15 grand and haven't fixed it, so I need to spend more than that. But actually, what I think is the case, they spent 15 grand on stuff that actually didn't cure the problem. Everything online I've found relating to 430 and F430 knocking says that it's usually something fairly simple. One of the issues though is that Dick Lovett, because my car was a Ferrari approved, could only put Ferrari parts on. And some of the Ferrari parts, particularly the ball joints, don't have a very good reputation. But because I've got this car privately, for want of a better word, I can put whatever parts on it I like without fear of the finance company being unhappy with me. So that's what I'm going to do. Next week, my buddy Anthony is going to be taking this car off to center gravity. I'll meet him there. The car's going to get looked over by them and they're going to see what the problem actually is. I've got faith in those guys. I think they're going to be able to sort the problem for me. And at the same time, we'll probably replace a bunch of ball joints, bushes and all sorts of things. That is going to be documented on my second channel. Yes, you heard that right. I have now a second second YouTube channel, but if you haven't noticed, don't worry, that's not your fault. I am keeping it reasonably quiet, mentioning it now only in a couple of videos and hoping people will sign up. If you're interested, it's called JM and Friends, and I'll put the link to it in the description down below. And if I've forgotten to do that, somebody please remind me and I'll do it. That's going to get sorted. Then I want to fix the exhaust. It's got the same problem as the last one did. It's starting to split and it's pouring powder out every now and again. Common old Ferrari thing. The exhausts, it seems, weren't that well made. So I wanted to replace the exhaust anyway, which means that really doesn't bother me all that much. I want this to sound like a proper Ferrari. I want this to sound like a 355 or a 360. And I know I can't achieve that exactly, but I can get darn close. So. Once the suspension is sorted, once everything else is done, the exhaust is next on the list. And then probably next year, I'll also be changing the color as well, possibly the wheels. I'm not gonna go mad. I'm not gonna go wild. I still like this car in its factory guys. I just wanna tweak it and make it the car I would have bought if I could have specified one of these new in 2010. Beyond that though, I have unfinished business with the 430 Scuderia. I wanna drive this car, I wanna enjoy it. And at some point, I am going to take it on track. This is the track focused Ferrari. I'm a useless track driver, but I think it will be a waste to have this car and not take it there at least once. The new exhaust will hopefully help with that because it should be just a little bit quieter than this one, which is already far too loud for the vast majority of UK track days. So that is my new car. That is my replacement for my 430 Scuderia. Am I absolutely mad? Possibly, but please tell me in the comment section if you were in this position and if you had, let's just say, £200,000 to spend on a supercar, where would your money have gone? I'd love to know. I'd love to hear from you. As ever, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.